China has changed a lot since I first came here in the late 70s. What used to be sleepy villages are now thriving megacities. Back then, China's most valued asset was cheap labor. And so they became a factory to the world, growing their economy 70-fold in less than four decades. <laughs> Think about that. Nothing like it has happened before in the history of mankind. To power it all, China built more than a thousand coal plants, which contribute to an energy sector that pumps out an astounding 20% of the gases warming the planet. I like this one. Try it. Nice. That looks nice on you. Yes? Yeah. It looks nice on you. Were you born in China? Kevin Mo really is a top climate advisor to the American and Chinese governments. He came down from Beijing to meet with me. In the Walmart, a lot of made in China stuff, exactly like here. That's why they're saying this is a factory of the world. Yeah. It's, that's what China becomes now. He tells me if China's going to quit coal, it will have to pivot away from so much reliance on manufacturing and dirty industry. So how will the economy have to adjust? How will it change? Well, now you have to transition to a service-based economy, which is finance, finance, IT, okay. insurance, okay. those kind of things. Yeah, okay. Not like energy-intensified yes. industries like steel, cement, yeah. those kind of things. Yeah, it. So it's different. Yeah. So if they can make that transition? If they can make that transition, the economic growth will be more sustainable and consume less energy, but it generate more revenues. In your opinion, can they do it? And can well, they do it as fast as they hope to? Well, let's say this. If China doesn't make all these changes and still use the previous growth model, economic growth model, then the scenario would be, by 2050, China's carbon emissions would be more than the current total carbon emissions in the world. That much carbon dioxide in the air would make life on Earth unbearable. But Kevin claims China's leaders acknowledge this threat and are making plans to ensure that doesn't happen. The problem is that if China shifts away from manufacturing, other countries, including ones that burn lots of coal, will be picking up the slack. And so the benefit to the climate is unclear. Many of the hurricanes that are impacting the United States are actually sort of tracking here through the Bahamas and past Cuba. This is Quesal Bank right here. This is where we're headed. And we're in this area specifically because... It's a submerged bank off the Florida coast. It has some really deep holes in it called blue holes. Well, these blue holes, they accumulate sediment through time that actually provides a record of past hurricanes. All this marine sediment's getting washed in day in and day out and just accumulating this in this beautiful pile. Of That's just perfectly collecting sediment over time. Right, so it's really well positioned to be sort of our weather station uh, monitoring the hurricanes oh, that have impacted North America. It's going back hundreds and hundreds of years and even millennia. It's fascinating to learn that these underwater caves called blue holes actually contain the history of hurricanes. To reveal that history, Jeff explains that he drills long tubes into the sea floor. I'm gonna lift it up and you're gonna put a cap on it as fast as you can. Pulling up layers of mud. All right, let's get it up on the deck. Revealing the core sample inside. It's those strata that hold ancient clues about our future. Hurricanes are often related to sea surface temperatures. And so one of the concerns is that with the planet warming so much, we might see hurricanes getting much more intense. In increase in frequency or in intensity, or both? We're sort of wrestling with that. It's those you know, Cat 3, Cat 4, Cat 5 hurricanes that our computer models suggest will actually increase with global warming. So the data that you could be collecting here could tell us that we are heading into a new age of superstorms, basically. We can basically have a climate experiment that's run over millennium, telling us when you get warm sea surface temperatures, you should get many more very intense hurricanes. I like that, nature's climate experiment. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the short answer is yes. Yeah. Wow, that's Cuba. The blue hole we're going to look at is right there. Has anyone ever done this work before? No, I mean, this is really hard to do. We're out in the middle of the ocean, going into an area that's quite shallow, so you can't get a really large oceanographic ship in here. 
but yet when you get there, you have to core down 300 feet, so you need some significant pieces of equipment to do that. It's a really challenging place to work. If the weather doesn't cooperate, if a piece of equipment breaks, somebody gets hurt, it's possible that we could walk away with nothing. I can't believe I'm on this groundbreaking mission to explore a blue hole. We're going to look into the past to discover the future of hurricanes that could someday make landfall. I think it's important for people to take notice about climate change because it's, it's important for our survival. It's important for everyone's life. I want to do something now before it's too late. And that's why I'm doing this documentary, quite frankly. The issue that I'm exploring on my episode is the rainforest. And the rainforest, it's something very personal to me because the largest part of the rainforest is in my country of Brazil and I feel like it's my responsibility as a human being to bring awareness to something that I feel is vital for our existence. And I feel like it's the most precious natural resource. This forest is providing a stable life for all of us on the planet, so I think it's everyone's problem. In my job as a model, I've always been very protected because I never really allow people to put out my voice. And my job is very much a visual thing, you know, it's like a picture and it's a frame and people make assumptions based on that image. But now it's like vulnerable for me because I'm coming out with something that actually is personal to me. Natural resources are not infinite, you know, there's only so much land, there's only so much water. Greed is an unfortunate trait of human race. And it's about short-term thinking instead of long-term understanding of the natural process of things. So sad to see it like this. I mean, people need to know this. I mean, it, it acts all of us. We keep being destructive. We're not gonna have great quality of life that we are used to. The episode that we're shooting now is about California and how we're seeing the effects of climate change here, dramatically here with temperatures rising and us losing the snowpack, how that is having an effect on water specifically, and how the lack of water is affecting everyone down the line. We're in Tulare County, California, which is one of the most important crop growing areas, not just of California, not just of the United States, but of the world. And they've been, like the rest of California, in drought for over four years now. In the Central Valley is right now dying in front of us. So because of the drought, they're forced to only use water from their wells, which means they're sucking up all the groundwater, wells are going dry, and the groundwater itself is becoming depleted. So this is it. Yeah, this canal here has been dry for going on almost three years. Three years like this. We are relying so much on things that we have no control over. I mean, the big picture in all of it is worrying the real world struggles that we're gonna face if this situation continues. You know, I'm confident that we'll survive, but I think the drought has given us the opportunity to do this, to share our stories and the fruit that comes from farming and how it feeds everybody. So when we have rain, we'll, we'll continue to farm. Right. We'll, we'll make crops and we'll continue to feed the world. We do know with climate change, droughts are going to be more frequent and of longer duration. And people who farm here have got to learn to live in a new environment, which means the rest of the country and the rest of the world has to learn to live with that new environment. It's alarming. There's no time to waste. We have to bang on the drum and try to get as much attention as we can, however we can. I want you to meet my protege, Delaney. Hello, Hi. Delaney. I've heard so much about you. Have a seat. Delaney Reynolds, 16-year-old budding scientist, somebody who found out about climate change and sea level rise. And she's really engaged, and she's really interested, and she wants to tell other kids about it. Is it true? I've heard that you are a student of climate change. Yes, that is true. That's very impressive at your age. I go into classrooms and community centers, and I speak to anyone that's going to listen about the problem. This graph shows predictions for sea level rise, and I show them real science from IPCC reports, Union of Concerned Scientists, NASA, and they get it. A message of hope, a message of solutions, and the surprising thing was it came from a kid. Today, I'm going to talk to you guys about my passion, which is global warming and sea level rise. So it seems like 
that's the trend with the youth movement. Yeah. It's like more and more people accepting what's happening. We have to come together and decide whether we want to sink or swim. Is there going to be a Miami when she grows up? Is she going to be able to raise her family here? Is she going to be able to live here? What if Miami can't be saved? Will you leave? If that does happen, then we're either going to have to get out or build up. But I actually have hope that that won't happen. We will be able to solve this problem. I think we have to solve this problem. 16 years old and so filled with promise and potential and hope. Have we given you hope? Yes. Finally, I found some, some hope. We talked about hope. Can we do this? And we came to the conclusion that, yeah, we can. We just need to get kids on board and we need to get our political leaders on board. Pendant des années, personne n'utilisait les mots changement et climat dans la même phrase. C'est ce qui se passe maintenant. C'est la plus grande sonnette d'alarme de tous les temps. On dirait une zone morte. C'est vraiment choquant. S'il n'y a plus de puits, oh mon dieu, il n'y a pas de mer. Et la terre ne fonctionne plus. Un monde à sauver, série inédite sur National Geographic.